Welcome to The Writing Gals, four sweet romance authors talking about writing as we stay up late. Tonight, we are super excited to have Elena Johnson with us, and she's going to be teaching her, us all her wonderful ways of how she does her launch strategies. Um, but first, we are going to just kind of give an update of what we're all working on right now, kind of just what we have going on. So, Victorine, do you want to tell us what you've been doing? Sure. I've been... Okay, so for the last few episodes, I've been working on my next billionaire book, right? Well, <laughs> I got really into it and realized that this is more romantic suspense than any of my other billionaire books. So it's actually not going to be part of that series anymore. I'm just going to make it a standalone because it just doesn't fit the the vibe that I have going with the other books. Um, but I'm almost done with it. I'm making a novella and I probably will have it out in a just like a week or two because I'm really nearing the end and then I'll um, get it edited and put out there pretty soon. So I'm super excited about it. And I have no idea what I'm going to call it. <laughs> <laughs> well, awesome. Um, what about you, Amy? What do you have going on? Well, just like last week, I was packing up and leaving. I am at my sister-in-law's house this evening and we are leaving tomorrow morning. So I popped on to say hi. And I have gotten like no writing done, but I've been releasing books. So that's been awesome. And I just released Marrying a Prince, which is book four of my fake marriage series. And then on the first, my first book of my YA series just went live. So I've been trying to like in between service, been trying to figure out where I'm ranking and doing all those things. So I did um, a pre-order for Marrying a Prince for about a week at $2.99. I launched it at $2.99. And it rose to about 1300 on its own. And then a week after I launched it, I set it to 99 cents and had like everybody and their dog send it out. And I got to 140 in the store, which was pretty awesome. And then, of course, it went down again and then kind of came back up today. So um, after 30 days, then I'll kind of give a launch recap of how I felt that did. It was nice to have all my newsletters go out at once and not have to worry about setting it up through that like slow release time period. So I did enjoy that part of it, but we'll see. And I'm excited to learn about what Elena has to say <laughs> for us. Me too. Uh, Michelle, what have you been doing? I'm in final edits for my mermaid book. I'm going to be sending it to my proofreader on Tuesday and, and I will be releasing it on the 15th. And that's my goal with that. And then I've got my Regency novel, the Unwanted Suitor that's going to go live on September 5th. And um, while all those launches are getting going with no no newsletter existing at all because I've only got a contemporary newsletter right now, so that's going to be fun, um, I'm going to be working on my next contemporary novel. So um, ah. if I can write, I have a hard time writing during launches. Um, I'm going to try and be disciplined. Like our guest lady is so disciplined and has taught in many workshops. I'm still trying to rise to that level of discipline. But anyway, that's all I've got going on. Awesome. What about you, Elena? What have you been doing? Um, I just want to say that we all do what works for us. So if you can't write during launch, don't write during launch. It's no big deal. <laughs> um, I am writing a, a Brides and Beaches book that will be out in October. So... I usually write three to six months out and I'm kind of panicking that I'm writing a book that will be out in October. So all of you are like, oh, I'm finishing this book and it'll be out in a week. And I'm like, what? <laughs> I have a little bit of panic inside for all of you. <laughs> so like, That's not okay. But so I'm writing that. It comes out October 24th or something like that. And um, I have a new series that's, that Liz, I have a pen name Liz Isaacson that's launching on the 9th. So that will be good to get a new series going for the second half of 2018. So awesome. Um, I'm kind of with you on the having the book coming out a lot later than ready, but I'm panicking. Mine, I have one set to come out in the end of October, and it, I just barely finished the first chapter for the fifth time that I hope it'll actually stick this time. So uh, we'll see how that all goes. So, yeah, um, for me, I have been on vacation for the last two weeks and didn't do very much writing, mostly because I was traveling, but also because I was stuck again, because that's what I like to do with this book. 
But um, I think I figured out what I'm going to do. I just had to tweak it a little bit. And now I hope that it will come out really fast because I set up a pre-order and I have to get it done. So yeah, that's what I'm doing. Um, so now we'll just go right into tonight's broadcast and I will introduce Elena officially because um, she's really awesome and I want you to all know all the cool things about her. Uh, so Elena Johnson is the USA Today bestselling author of dozens of novels from young adult contemporary romance to adult beach romances. She also writes under the pen name of Liz Isaacson, the USA best USA, sorry, I can't talk. USA Today bestselling author of cowboy inspirational romance novels. She loves all things to do with contemporary cowboys, beaches, and will write romance in Texas, Montana, Hawaii, California, and anywhere else she can find horses and mountains or warm sand and ocean waves. She lives in Utah where she teaches elementary school, taxis her daughter to dance several times a week, and eats a lot of peanut butter M&Ms while writing. She is a member of SCW. SCBWI, RWA, and NINC, and a popular speaker for libraries, teens, and writers' conferences across the United States. And you can find out more about Elena at her websites, um, www.elenajohnson.com or www.lizisaacson.com. So, without further ado, we're going to ask you all the hard questions. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm just, I, I'm super excited to hear more about your launch strategy um, because I, I've seen that you've done pre-orders and that you have been really successful with them. So um, yeah, I'm just gonna ask my first question and get going because I need to learn everything that you have to say. Um, so the first question is, what is a typical launch like for you, like sales wise? Oh wait, wrong, sorry, that was the old questions. Um, we'll get to more of that one later. The first one, sorry. Um, how far in advance do you plan your pre-orders? Let's start at the beginning, sorry. <laughs> oh, okay. So I plan my production schedule and my re re release dates for a full calendar year. So when I say I have a book coming out in October, I kind of planned for that last year. I usually do it about October. And I go, okay, what am I going to be able to do in the next year? Where am I in my writing right now? When will this book come out? What do I think I can get done? So I have a spreadsheet that I use um, and I kind of update it. I have to update it all the time. I update my production calendar and my schedule all the time as things change, as I maybe don't write as fast as I used to, um, or I don't meet a deadline, or um, I decide I wanna write more books in a certain series or something like that. So I usually go through my production calendar and schedule and update my spreadsheet every two or three months. But I know about four to six months in advance if I'll have a book ready to release or not. So I set my pre-orders up on Amazon for the entire 90-day period because I'm all in in KU and that's the longest they'll allow me to do it. You can, on iBooks and Nook, if you're wide, you can allow pre they allow pre-orders for up to a year. So people can put their books up really far in advance on those other retailers. But that's what I do and I kind of just plan my, my whole year out on my little spreadsheet to make sure that I know what I'm doing and, and where I am and what I need to do next to make sure that I meet the dates that I have set for myself. So, and I'm, you know, this is all my indie publishing stuff, so I can really kind of do whatever I want. Um, but yeah, and I can show that if, if you want. Do you want to see that spreadsheet? Yeah, yeah, I would love to see that. Okay, so I think I can screen share it, maybe, yes. Oh, I've got the colored will of death. Let's try it. <laughs> I am screen sharing. So this is my 2018 release schedule. So you can see I started in January and it I've got my title and who's writing it and if it's written and if I have a cover, if it's been edited, formatted up for pre-order, if it has promotion, if I've put it in my review crew, my graphics, if I'm doing a paperback and am I starting ads on it. So I kind of keep track of this right here um, for the whole year. So I can kind of see where I am. And when I've released a book, I make it green. So I've released 24 books this year. And this is how I keep track of what I need to do. Um, if it's yellow over here, I know I need to go, okay, what am I doing here? What promo graphics do I need to make? When do I put these books in my review crew? All that kind of stuff. And I can tell which books I'm writing. I'm actually writing two books right now. So one that comes up out in December and one that comes out in October. And then down here, I have ideas and things that I would like to do in the future for different series and different things that I wanna do. 
So that's kind of what that looks like for me as far as the planning part of using a pre-order. Now, did I come back? There I am. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> so that's how I um, sort of plan and plan my pre-order so that I know what books I'm ready to put up and, and then then I move stuff around a lot, like I said. So that's kind of what I do. Okay, awesome. So when you do the... Um do the pre-order, do you have your books ready to go before you set it up? Or are they just like, yes, uh, Kevin, they are, they are, they are, they're yeah. all written. Because I'm kind of a freak and I actually, when I first started, um, I was publishing every 11 weeks. So I did that because Amazon gave me a 90 day pre-order, which is about 12 weeks. And I could put a link in the back of the previous book and I could get pre-orders on that next book that was coming out. And I did once where I wrote chapter one just to put it in the back of the previous book and that was all I'd written on it. And I kind of freaked out because I was like, holy cow, I have to write this book and edit it and proofread it and everything in just 12 weeks, well, actually 11. And <laughs> I it freaked me out. So I don't do that anymore. Um, I, I did, I just put a book up for pre-order on October 23rd and I'm only about halfway through, but I'm a little bit behind, so I'm trying to get caught up and I've kind of learned that I can write a little faster and that I'll make it. So it's okay, but literally I did it once in 2016, it freaked me out and I just did it again one time. So typically I have the whole book drafted um, and I'll send it to the editor, put it up for pre-order. And then when I when I get those back, I do the edits and then I give it to my review crew while my proofreader, proofreader looks at it and make sure that that's all lined up so that I can make sure that I get the edits and copy edits done before the final file is due, which is five days before your release date when you do a pre-order. Okay, that's awesome. I think that is really smart to do that because I couldn't, like, I did it the dumb way this time. I didn't have the whole book ready and it's like, ah, I got to finish it. Panic because you're yeah. like, oh, I hope I can get it done. Yeah. So if someone who's clearly releasing as soon as I get something finished, how did you, how did you kind of jump that bridge to where you were working ahead of schedule? Okay, so when I first started self-publishing, I was like, I'm going to do every 11 weeks. I had the first book done and it was summertime. So I thought, okay, I'm going to put this book out. I think I put it out in September sometime. I don't know the exact date. It was a few years ago. I put it out in September and I thought, okay, my goal is to make sure that I have three books before I put that one out. So I just started that way. And so um, as I've accelerated my publishing, I fall farther and farther behind. So my goal, I publish too much. I actually publish a little bit too much. And so my goal, I mean, this year I'm going to publish something like 34 books, which is just insane and stupid and ridiculous. My goal next year is 24. Once a month for Liz and once a month for Elena so that I can get ahead again because I don't like feeling like I have to sit down and write every day if I don't want to because if I don't want to, I don't want to. Does Do that make sense? A lot of people use like the Amazon 30, 60, 90. So do you feel like when you release so frequently that you're losing out because I, I was in a conversation with somebody who releases really frequently too and they said they felt like if they released like once every week that it didn't really help them any because they weren't having that extra boost or what did you think about that um I just barely did my first rapid release I did three books in July and three sorry three books in June and three books in July once three Thursdays and then I took one week off the week of the fourth of July and then three Thursdays in July and I liked it. I think it worked really well, but I think that you really have to have a huge, huge reader base to release that much, especially if you want to release at full price, which I do. So, I mean, I'm, I, I think I have a decent reader base, but I don't think I have a reader base that can support buying 34 books from me a year because they buy a lot. They want to read a lot of books, right? So I actually think that when I release less, that I'll get more sales. So I did the once a month from January to about June and I was seeing really good, really good sales. Just once a month, first Tuesday of the month, the book came out and you know, I had pre-orders all set up and stuff. So I think you can overwhelm your fan base if your fan base isn't very big. Does, did that answer your question? And yeah, I do like being on the new hot new release list and stuff. And 
um, that is the 30 day list. So you can kind of cannibalize yourself if you've got a lot of books out um, that are on, that are in the same genre on the same list. So, but it's kind of cool too to go, I have eight of the top 20 books in this category. Like that's kind of cool too, but it just depends on, you know, what you want to do, I guess. Okay. Um, that's awesome. Um, I had a question, but then it just left my head. So there we go. Um, so what, um, or I guess, can you get a series page for a pre-order then? And what are the benefits of that? You really can. And so I really like having a series page for my pre-orders so people can see what's coming. And I guess I should give a little, um, I don't know the word, caveat or like heads up at the beginning. I've trained my Liz readers to expect pre-orders. So that is a massive part, I think, of why when I tried the no pre-order thing, it didn't really work as well for me as I hoped it would. Because for the past, you know, three and a half years, they expect to be told when my books are coming. And I encourage pre-orders during that time. So I really like to have a series page because I can sell a lot of pre-orders on a lot of books by sending a newsletter. So I have my series that starts on August 9th. It has three books in it. Amazon's only linked two of the books to the series, and I announced it a couple of days ago in my newsletter. I'm really far behind on announcing. I would usually announce as soon as the books go up. Um, so I have 12 weeks of time to gather pre-orders, but I've been doing the rapid release, and I feel like I send two emails a week sometimes, <laughs> and I'm trying to get them to buy those books, not the pre-order books, so it's been kind of crazy. But I did announce it, and I probably sold a couple hundred books of those two books, from that and the third one is not linked and I have sold like three. So I think there's a huge benefit from having that series page. I think even once your books are out, you need a series page. It's a, it's a huge thing that can help sell more books. Um, but I think that it really helps because people go, oh, she's got two coming. I'll just get them both now. And that's something that I've worked really hard on the last, I'm gonna say eight months in my newsletter. If you read it, you, you'll see, um, you know, I'll say something like, get it now because life is busy when school starts again and you'll forget or, you know, something like that. And I'll say, get it now and it will show up and you'll be able to relax and enjoy once the kids are out the door, you know, things like that. So that I can encourage pre-orders for that. So I do like having the pre-order series page and having all of that um, because it almost feels like an impulse. Like I better get this now so I don't forget. And those are the, I want that. I want people to buy whenever. And if I can get them to buy because they don't want to forget, I'll take it. <laughs> okay. So, and, and that's just the, like the series page on Amazon, right? Yeah. And so how, cause I just put mine up yesterday mm -hmm. and it's not showing up on my series page for my other bugs. Do you have to, does it just take time or do I, would, I need to contact them? I would give it three days. And if it doesn't show up, they actually have, when you go to contact us, one of the things is Kindle series bundle page and you give them the ASIN and they add it. They will give you a little bit of a hard time because it's a pre-order okay. and they'll say, oh, we don't add pre-orders because then the one click um, to buy option disappears from the series page. And I just tell them, that's fine. I don't care about that one click to buy button. Please add it and they will. Okay. So they do try to act like they can't, but it's Amazon and you, they can, so. <laughs> okay, that's good to know. I might be doing that in a yeah, couple of days. They'll ask you, if we put it on, you won't have the one click to buy option. And it's only on the series page where somebody can one click to buy your whole series. Um, and like, That's fine. Put the pre-order on. It's no big deal. Okay, cool. Good to know. Um, so what other benefits do you find from having a pre-order? Okay, so I really like to have my website up to date with covers and links so I can send people to my website. So when I sent my newsletter out for this new um, series, three of the books are up, but the fourth one's not. And I said, go here to my website. I like to direct people to my website because I have my Facebook pixel on it. And I use my Facebook pixel for Facebook advertising. So I can gather data in all kinds of ways that way. So I really like to have my website as a place where I can send people to learn more about the books that are not on pre-order if they're 90 days out, more than 90 days out. Um, I like to put links in the back of my uh, previous books. Um, and I know I can do that with a smart URL and update the smart URL as soon as the book is live. But 
for me, the list of tasks that I had to do when the book became live was overwhelming with my personality and my day job and everything I had to do. So I just really like having it all, the book's up, I've got the link, I can do all that kind of back end work that I need to do before. I really like having the option to do a Kindle countdown deal the day after a book releases. If it's been on pre-order for longer than 30 days and has been rolled in Kindle Select, you can do a Kindle countdown deal. Um, so if the book came out today, August 2nd, you could do a, a countdown deal on the 4th. So technically you can put a book up and not announce it. People will still find it because there's another thing I'm gonna talk about in just a second. People will still find it, but if you wanna do a 99 cent sale, the countdown deals are seven days and you earn 70% royalties instead of 35. So I really like to, if I'm gonna put a book at 99 cents, I really wanna earn that 70 cents over the 35. So I like that about it. Um, I like knowing and kind of looking and being like, oh, I sold a thousand books in pre-order, so I know I'm gonna get X amount of money, whatever, if the book is $2.99 or $3.99. So I mentioned I don't like scrambling for marketing, booking ads, securing newsletter swaps, and other things like that last minute without a link. That was really stressful for me to then try to find everybody that said would share my book, and now I have the link, and it was really stressful for me. So I didn't, I like having the link. I like claiming my book on Author Central because Amazon will send emails about my books while they're in pre-order. So that was what I meant by about some people will still buy it because Amazon will send them an email, but then you can still do a Kindle countdown deal um, for the extra royalties. So Amazon will send emails and we want Amazon to send emails for us, I do at least. And they usually send one upon a release, usually a few days after, recommended for you type books, whatever. I got two today from Amazon for two of my books that are on pre-order, one Liz one and one Elena one. And I went and checked the Elena one and I had like 11 pre-orders today, where yesterday I had like two. So that email that Amazon sends out sells books for me and they'll do it in pre-order and they'll do it after release. So it's like getting double the marketing from the best marketing machine in the world. So I really like that about it. Um, I like claiming my book on BookBub and using their pre-order feature. You can, um, if you how based, it's based on how many followers you have is how much you pay. So I do a pre-order, usually I'll send a pre-order email to my followers like two or three days before it comes out. I found that that works best. If you do it a little too far out, they're like, oh, that's too far away. But two or three days, I, I get a lot of pre-orders from those BookBub things. So, and I also really like that BookBub will send a release, an email on release day, instead of me having to wait for the book to go live, then claim it, have them review it, and have them send the email a few days later. So I've actually started, they'll send it in the morning. I've kind of been tracking it. And I have started sending my newsletter a little bit later. So I use them as my first wave of sales on release day. And then I use my newsletter as the second wave. So those are just some things that I really like about it that I think are beneficial for, for me and, and have helped me um, increase my pre-order numbers. Okay. okay. Those are good points. I'm going to have to, oh, I'm like echoing now. Um, I'm going to have to like rewatch this again. I'm like, like, oh, I got to get all these good things. <laughs> well, I typed it up because and I can oh. just send, I can just send you my, it's a Google doc. I can just send it to you. Oh, awesome. <laughs> yeah. I'm, yeah. I got to save that. <laughs> like, I'm not good live. I'm going to type this up so that I hit the points I want to hit. <laughs> That's awesome. We can put it on our Facebook page. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Cool. Um, okay, so what do you do to like help your pre-order sales? You've already said a couple of the things you've done, but can you do like AMS ads or? You can. Um, I don't do AMS or Facebook ads for pre-orders. I have in the past for select books when I was doing the big run for the USA Today list, I did but they were expensive and they underperform. Pre-orders are a tough gig because people, we live in a world where people want instant. So um, I, I, I've stopped, I don't do Amazon ads or Facebook ads on pre-orders anymore. I use my author Facebook page, 
which I post to five to seven days a week anyway. So I'm getting some good engagement. People are used to me posting there. Um, my rule of thumb is I try to do Monday through Friday for sure. I'll do a weekend if I have something big going on. But I try to do three things about my books, upcoming books or books that are just released, and two days where I just talk about personal stuff or my dogs or you know whatever and try to get some really good engagement that way. So I post my pre-orders there, usually about a week out, uh, five weeks out, and whenever I feel like I haven't said something about them in a while. My main source is my newsletter. So I use my newsletter three times. Typically, if I'm not in the middle of a rapid release, I'll use my newsletter three times. So once when the book first goes up, 12 weeks out to alert fans, I've got a new book coming. You're going to want to pre-order it. It's coming out, you know, such and such time. It can be a busy time. Get it now while you can. And I can usually get a few hundred pre-orders from that. And then I just sort of let it go because those people who are opening those emails are your super fans. So because we all know not everybody opens our newsletters, but our super fans open every single one and they buy whatever you put up. So I'm trying to get them to buy right away because it kind of boosts the book up. Um, in visibility and Amazon will put it on the new release list even though it's not out yet So I can get quite a bit there and then I send another newsletter at six weeks So halfway between the pre-order and release um, I'll send another one. Did you miss it? I have a new series or I have a new book or whatever and it's just kind of like a reminder because we want to give people I went to RWA and they said seven touches, but I try for five, five touches. So if I didn't get you with my first letter, maybe I'll get you with my second. Um, maybe they were busy, they opened my email and got interrupted, you know, that kind of stuff. Maybe they were waiting to get paid and then forgot. Um, so, and then I send, of course, on release day. And that's when I, I have a lot of KU readers. So about 80% of my income comes from page reads in KU. And most of those people are not going to pre-order your book because they're, they're waiting for it to come out so they can read it in Kindle Unlimited. And so that's that, that newsletter on release day that I send typically captures a lot of those page reads. And, and that typically is what boosts the book the most is the page reads. So that, that's pretty much what I've been doing um, using my author page. Sometimes I post to Instagram or Twitter, but not really. Um, I'm usually just using my Facebook posts and my newsletter to, to boost those books and get them more visible. And then, of course, I, I will use a BookBub, the pre-order feature on BookBub, and I do count on Amazon to send out that pre-order email, which they do. So they have the last, I don't know, year for me or so. They've been sending those whenever I've got a book on pre-order. So Okay. So so when you say that you like share it with your newsletter, is that when it's like the like the main thing on the newsletter or is it like because yeah. I know a lot of times um like we'll put our books like at the bottom of the newsletter like we have all these books do you it's, do the, you main it's okay. the main thing and the only thing I don't okay. I don't put anybody else's books in when I'm doing that okay and I try really hard not to put anybody else's books on in my newsletter on release day because I don't think it's fair to them because people on my newsletter are going to buy my book before they scroll down and buy theirs. Yes. So I find I, I typically don't see great results with that. I've done it and I always feel bad because I'm like, sorry, they, you know, I've got 50% clicks on my book and yours got like five. Like it just hasn't been, it hasn't worked out for people in the past. So I try really hard not to do shares um, when I'm releasing or talking about a pre-order because it doesn't, it's not really beneficial for them. Yeah. You'll, you'll steal their thunder every time. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, well, you know, there, it's my newsletter. So <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I do, I do think that it helps. I think I have sold books for people or, or helped or whatever, but yeah, usually not on release day. I try to do that on my second email of the week or just another email where I'm not doing a release or something. So. Okay. So do you though have at like the bottom of your regular newsletters, do you have like links to all your books? I do. Every single one of them. And, and do you put like your books that are on pre-order in that section then? Yes. Also? Okay. And then in parentheses, I'll say pre-order now. Okay. So they know it's a pre-order. Okay, cool. Um, good to know. So um, do you have like a ballpark of your pre-sales numbers, um, yeah. your pre-order sales numbers? So th that depends a lot for me. It depends on the series. Um, I, I have five Liz Isaacson series. The sixth one starts on the ninth. 
Um, they have various numbers of books in them. Um, it depends, honestly, on the trope. One of my very best-selling books was a, an older, older couple. He was 47 and she was 38 and they met on a dating app. And that book is, I don't know, I think my readership is older and it really resonated with them. And that book just did really well on pre-order. Um, and it's still, it's like book four or something in the series, maybe three, and it still sells better than any other book in the series. Mm -hmm. So I think sometimes the trope uh, matters. Um, and, you know, if people read about it and they see themselves in it or something, that matters. But I know what my best selling series is. That's my Three Rivers Ranch series. It's my first series. It's still my very best series. So I know that when I put a new book in that series, I don't have to do a whole lot. I can send a newsletter once or twice, and I can usually get about a thousand pre-orders um, at minimum, like without doing a whole lot of work. Like, hey, there's a new Three Rivers book, like you should get it. And the, all those books are three ninety nine. If they're novellas, and for me, a novella is thirty thousand words or less. And if it's above that, it's a full length novel, fifty to fifty five thousand words, and they're three ninety nine. Um, in my other series, my Brush Creek Brides, I just did the rapid release on this summer. Um, I was getting anywhere from three to 500 and I released six uh, over the course of seven weeks. So, and those are at 2.99. And so I think that's pretty good for releasing so quickly. Like I said, I think sometimes you can hurt yourself by releasing too much. Um, first in series books typically sell worse, which you would think they wouldn't, but sometimes people aren't sure that, they want to start a new series right now. Some people wait until there's a whole bunch of books out in the series and then they buy them all. So typically my first in series books sell less in pre-order. Um, but once I have three to four books out in that series, my um, books four, five, and six, I try really hard to do six books in every series because five and six are always my biggest money makers. My pre-orders will double from book one. So those are anywhere from I'd say 500 on a new on a new first in series book the one that comes out on the ninth has just over about 350 now once I sent my email and like I said I hadn't been doing any of the stuff I normally do so it's a little low right now but um, I think it'll bump up it'll get up there by the ninth um, as I send my other emails and stuff, or I use my BookBub features. And I also use my pre-order cells kind of as a gauge for whether I should write more books in a particular series or not. If book five in a series isn't outselling book four in pre-order, maybe I need to focus somewhere else. So it kind of helps drive my production as well so that I can be spending my time as wisely as possible. Does that make sense? Yeah. And then for my billionaires, which billionaires are really hot right now, so they're really kind of abnormal, I think. Um, I didn't do pre-orders for the first four because I thought I'm gonna give this strategy a try. Um, but I did put books five and six up for pre-order just for 34 days. And I did it because I wanted to do a great big sale. I would have six books out and they came out on July 4th and I wanted to do first book free and all the other books at 99 cents the following week. And I wanted a countdown deal for that. I didn't want to only earn 35 cents on two brand new books. So I put it up 34 days out and in just that 34 days, and I had just launched the series and really Elena hasn't had a new book to speak of in a long, long time. And I've taken down all the science fiction and fantasy. It was like a rebrand. I'm trying to rebrand her. I had um, just over 300 pre-orders on those books um, with just a third of the pre-order time and kind of a brand new, new to beach romance name, but they're billionaires and they do really well in KU. So. Um, I think I get, I, I think last month in July, my six billionaire books were a third of my KU income total. Because oh, wow. they just do, they just, the KU readers there are just voracious. So it just depends on where the books are in the series and what I'm hitting hard. I have some books that I do what I call a soft release on where I don't do a whole lot. I post on Facebook, I send my newsletter. I'm like, yay, go. I do like a medium release where I'm like, this is the first in series or like second in series book or like a book with a big trope or something like that. And those books I'll put, uh, you know, an add on or something like that. And then I have what I call my hard releases. So I have soft, medium and hard. And those books I spend a lot in advertising on. I use Facebook and Amazon. Um, I, I, I do everything I can. I might buy an ad or something 
I usually release at full price. So I usually do an ad on the books previous in the series or something like that. But most of my books, depending on where I'm hitting, what kind of launch I'm doing, they'll range anywhere. I'll make anywhere from $3,500 to $6,000 in the first 30 days of a book's life. So, and that, that includes the pre-order income once okay. the book's life. So that's about where I'm hitting with every release that comes out. Nice. Um, I had, a, sorry, I keep losing my questions. I'm like, you keep saying all these good things. And I'm like, I'm like, I'm like I'm my questions. Much. nobody else is talking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If anyone else has questions, go ahead and ask them. Um, so what, so, so, you know, I know that you've tried the, um, like the launch that the writing gals talked about in our yeah. fourth video. Um, and then you also do the pre-order thing now more. Um, so what, is the appeal of doing the pre-order versus the launch um, that the writing girls talked about? So I, I've listed all the things that I really like. I really like having a link to book ads, secure newsletter swap, set up marketing, websites, posts, send in my newsletter, get my Amazon and book. Bus. So I really like all of that. And also for me, I think a lot of my issue was a personality issue. So I work during the day, I teach, my daughter dances a competitive schedule, and I found it really stressful to have to wait for a book to be live and then have all these tasks that I needed to do. So claiming and updating and preparing and emailing and it just it like would panic me and the book would go live in the middle of first grade and I'm like, six-year-olds are everywhere and I can't do anything and it kind of stressed me out. So I like the pre-order because I know the book's going to come out and it doesn't matter where I am in the world. I can be anywhere and the book will come out and my marketing is all set up and everything's ready to go. So I don't have to worry about that. I don't have to be at the computer on launch day and I really like that. And for me, I made less money. I know that people make money doing this. I know they do. Um, but I tried to do the no pre-order and sell the book for 99 cents, which I don't mind the book for 99 cents, but it's not, I don't make any money. I don't make any money on 99 cents. And so what I ended up doing, I did it with four Elena books and one Liz book. And that Liz book has been my worst launch in a year because what I ended up doing is I booked ads, $210 worth of ads for this 99 cent book. And I just, I don't, I mean, you have to sell a lot of books at 99 cents to make $210. And so I found that, you know, I was, and when the book's 99 cents, I don't know, it just, I didn't make very much money. I barely broke even by the time I factor in how much time I spent doing it, the cost of the cover, the advertising, blah, blah, blah. And so I analyzed it. I waited the 30 days after. And it, it was the worst performing book in that series. It was book um, five. It was book six. So I feel like it should have done really well. And it was my worst performing one in the series. It is making a little bit of a comeback now, 60 days out. Um, but it's been at full price for, you know, a lot of that time. So I made a note here when I looked it up. I sold about 250 less copies than I did in the first 30 days of that book's life than the previous book's life. And that was um, even at a low, lower lower royalty rate. So for me, I didn't I didn't really feel like it was worth it. But I do know that that, that works for people. And um, I think what it is is, I said this already, but for me as Liz, I've been, I mean, my list expects to know when my books are coming, not just when they're out. So I have a list that's trained to expect a pre-order. And I also think that if I were more new, if I were newer, trying to build a fan base, 99 cents can help with that. Um, and for me, I'm a little bit more established and um, the 99 cents, I mean, it gets, it gets a few sales, but I have to really sell a lot more to make up for the lost royalties from 3.99 to 99 cents. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, I, I wonder, do you think that um, also having the pre-order helps your also bots get um, to where they need to be? Or or did your also bots get, um, you know, where they needed to be with the, the uh, other launch? Yeah. I, I think they were okay. When I did the billionaires with no pre-order, 
the also bots came in in the right spot um, okay. from the newsletter swaps and stuff. So I didn't think that was too much of a problem. My Liz also bots are mostly Liz books because she has so many. So um, I didn't see a problem with the also bots there. Um, one thing I did try this year that was interesting to see. So I've built Liz in KU by using the KU benefits every 90 days, either a Kindle countdown deal at 99 cents or free books for five days. And that's how I built Liz. And so I decided in 2017, I gave away 650,000 books for free. So I decided that was too many books to give away for free. <laughs> I was like, this is like a lot of books to give away for free. And so I told my list in January that I was not going to be doing free in 2018, but that my first series would be 99 cents during their whole pre-order and first week of launch. And I was hoping that I would make up for my lost income in volume, just in sheer volume of books. Um, and I had to kind of wean my readers away from free which I'd spent, you know, years giving them free books. And I had some people who were starting to email me like, well, when will this one be free? I'll just wait till then. So I was trying to really get away from that. So my January to June releases were all 99 cents pre-order, 99 cents for the first week of launch. Um, and so I think it was a good compromise to do that, but I'm back to 399 now and I'm making more money than I did with the 99 cent pre-orders. Um, I do sell less books, but I make more money. So you just have to decide what your goal is. And my goal is to make money. I want to make as much money as I can. Is that greedy? It's a little greedy. <laughs> That's how I am too. So. <laughs> I want to make as much money as I can. So the very first place you have to start is with your goals. And there's no right or wrong goals. Like if a high rank is your goal, then a pre-order is not going to do that for you. It, it's Or it's much harder to get the pre-order to do that for you. Maybe a really short one, like what Amy said she did, like just a week and, and then moved it to 99 cents. Um, seems like she got a pretty high rank. Usually my ranks, my best one was on that dating app one I mentioned, and it got to like 320 on a 399 book. So that's about as good as I can do. I'm typically about 500 on launch, um, but it's with a full price book and I'm okay with that. So you just have to decide what you're okay with, what your goal is and work toward that goal. Like we all do that. So and I think you're right. It depends on how big your following is, how big yeah. your newsletter is, how established you are, things like that. Because as I was trying to claw my way up into visibility, you know, I used free a lot too, like yeah. you did. And, you know, that is helping me build my list. But now as my list grows bigger and bigger, I think I might be able to do some more of, of the things that you're doing, you know. Yes do a pre-order and go ahead and, and launch at full price rather than try and, and get that visibility. She's totally right. So, so I'm going to try and jump in here. For a yeah, go ahead. I was going to say really fast, one of, the, one of the things that we can kind of maybe gear the questions towards a little bit. Um, we had someone asking on our live feed why the Writing Gals launch strategy is different than yours and what do we recommend? as like the writing gals. And I think that what we all recommend is trying new things and experimenting because that's one thing that obviously you do and it works great for you to be able to try different things and say yes or no and, and build your, your business that way. And all of us are going to be coming into a book launch with different newsletter sizes, you know, different genres, different categories. We're all coming at this from different places. And so as the writing gals, um, we try and show you what we're doing and you can see if it's working and something that might work for you. And the strategy that we've been advising lately really has been based on helping people who aren't making any money and don't have any followers to get going. And so exactly. it's definitely something that change as time goes on. And we definitely are big proponents of constantly evaluating what's working and trying new things. Absolutely. And that's why I did your strategy is because I was like, mm, it seems to be working for them. I wonder if it will work for me. And I think that is one of the absolute best parts about being an indie author is I get to go, I want to try that. 
and see if it works for me because my genre is different and my readers are different and my list is different and the amount of time I've been around is different. Um, I will say, and I said this in a class I teach, that you have to be a little bit careful of the fan base that you're trying to build. So like Victorine said, um, you know, you use free to build up, but a lot of those people will only read free. So do I want free people on my list or do I want buyers on my list? Do I want people who will pay full price or do I want people who will do 99 cents only? And how you price your books kind of determines who is on your list. But I think if you're newer and you're trying to launch and you don't have a whole big backlist, 99 cents and free is, is the way to build that. So, I mean, I've got, I can send an email to my Liz list and my Elena list and it's 46,000 people. So, but I started at zero too. You know, I started at zero too. So. Perfect. Uh oh, we lost our moderator. Oh, Judy, you're, I just you're, beat myself. <laughs> are you leaving? <laughs> no, I'm just saying I really like that because I, um, like I've experimented a little enough. I, um, I contacted you a couple months ago trying to figure out your whole pre-order thing. And so I tried then um, and I noticed that since it was big book three, it was okay to yeah. release it full price and do a little pre-order. And it was my best launch so far. I still, I still did like the, um, kind of like the soft launch afterwards by having newsletter swaps going out over the next couple weeks. And that, I think, helped a lot as well. Um, but, yeah, I agree. Just experimenting and trying new things and listening to what's working for others is a great thing to because do. Sometimes you're like, oh, my gosh, Victorine does this, does this and it works so well. And you do it and you're like, this is a huge flop. <laughs> so right. you, just, you have to be willing to risk some things and learn what works for you. Exactly. Yeah. So um, when you do launch your book after a pre-order, do you just um, like announce it to the world like that first couple days or do you spread it out at all? How do, like what does your launch look after? So it's like I, said, I have soft, hard, medium and hard launches that I use, but I always use my newsletter. And I read something, I can't remember where, I wish I could remember because I could give them credit. Um, it might have been David Gogan, I don't know how to say his name, Goffrin. I subscribe to his emails, he emails every Friday. Um, he wrote the book, um, oh my gosh, I'm gonna forget it now, something to super fans. Anyway, I'll look it up. But I think I was reading his book and it said that he segments his email list over five days. And I thought, that's genius. I have a big list. Why don't I segment it and send an email Tuesday through Friday instead of sending one email on Tuesday only and getting this kind of huge spike, right? So I started that with my February book, the book that came out in February, and I segmented my list into five and I sent it you know, one every morning, Tuesday through Saturday. And I noticed that once I started doing that, my, my sales would come in from those newsletters in a more steady way. My rank would stay higher for longer. My visibility stays higher for longer. Amazon sends my emails out a few days after instead of like a week or two after. So I, I really like segmenting my newsletter and I experiment with that still to this day. So I just went to RWA, I listened to Mark Dawson talk. He has an email list of 100,000. And he says he segments it and sends it throughout the first, um, I think he said 24 to 48 hours. And I thought, is that what he said, Victorine? Were yeah. you? Yeah, I was there. Yeah, it was like within a day. And I within was like, a wow. Day. Yeah, maybe it was within that. a day. And I thought, okay, that's new. I've been doing one newsletter a day for five days. So with this um, pre-order release, this pre-order notification that I just did, I segmented it into four instead of five, and I did a morning and an afternoon email for two days. And yeah, my, my rank's gone up. I've sold a lot of books, and it kind of I hope that it will kind of stay there. It's on the hot new release list, you know? So it's just interesting. And then with an Elena book, she's writing some beach romances that are not billionaires, and they don't sell nearly as well. I segmented my list into five and I sent three on the first day, morning, noon, afternoon, and then I sent two the next day, morning, noon. So that was interesting. The book got quite high, I thought, for 
you know, a book that is not billionaires and kind of still, you know, I've got the billionaires, but this is a different series and, but it got quite high for me. It got up to like 1100 at a 399 release. And I was happy with that because it only had 55 pre-orders, but book one only had 25. So I feel like we're getting there. It will, it will go, you know? So I do that. I've been segmenting. So I highly recommend segmenting your newsletter list if you haven't been doing it just because it's kind of worked for me and I've really liked the steady sales over a longer time. Um, that helps a lot. I start an AMS ad 24 hours before launch. So um, because AMS, Amazon takes time to approve your ads. So they're getting faster and faster. But I've had them take two or three days to approve an ad for me before. And then the next time it'll take 12 hours or something. But if I set it up the day before for if I'm doing a medium or hard launch, I use AMS ads and they will be ready on release day and running that morning as soon as the book is live. So I do that um, as part of the launch. Um, I, I tried newsletter swaps and they work really great for Elena's billionaires. But for Liz, I still have not found a group that does what I do. So it's it's been hard because she writes Christian cowboy romances and they're clean, but they're not the same as billionaire romances. They're not the same as even like fake fiance series. They're not the same. They're not just not the same. And so I found that I wasn't really getting a huge benefit from doing them for Liz. So I kind of stopped doing those. I'm hoping that I can find a cowboy, contemporary cowboy group, but I haven't been able to find one yet. <laughs> so, so um, yeah. but that can be good too. It means you got like the corner on the market. You got everyone coming to you. <laughs> I, I, know, I know there's people out there that I just don't know. Cause I mean, I can see their books. I know who I'm targeting in AMS and stuff, but I'm not going to reach out to Linda Goodnight and be like, Hey, do you have a newsletter list that you want to send my book to? You know? <laughs> You're going to have to work your way into those relationships. <laughs> So, unless you're Amy, <laughs> yeah, I totally would. <laughs> yeah. So I've just been kind of relying on my newsletter and my Facebook, the Facebook ads. Now Liz has a really great tried and true audience for Facebook ads, and that comes from mostly, I think, just longevity. Like I have, you know, um, I put my pixel on all my book funnel pages and my website, and so I'm collecting all that information. And I can I can set an ad up there, and it will do pretty great, and it only costs me seven or eight cents um, per result. So I'm happy with that. Um, Elaine is having a hard time finding an audience on Facebook that costs less than thirty, and thirty is a lot for me. So I'm working on that still. Um, like I, I mentioned earlier, I've changed my newsletter language a little bit. I'll say the book is now available in Kindle Unlimited. So if you're part of that subscription, go read it today. Um, and then I also say, or add it to your permanent library so you can read over and over again. Because for my books, they're about 200 pages. At $3.99 is going to make me more money, more money than KU. Yeah. So I do encourage people to, I just say, add it to your permanent library so you can read it whenever you want. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> they can do in KU too, but, you know. So that's kind of what my launch looks like. Um, if I have, if it's a later book in this series, like book two or book three that I'm still trying to build a series on, I will sometimes set book one to 99 cents on a countdown deal, buy a couple ads for that because I'm constantly looking to just bring more readers into my work, more readers into my work because I have a large enough backlist that if I can get, keep that backlist making money and humming along, I don't. I don't rely on my new releases to make my money. All my most of my money comes from my backlist. So, I mean, if I make six thousand dollars on a new release in the first thirty days, I mean, I'm, I'm probably my backlist is making at least that, probably more. So, awesome. Um, so, if you could give us like one piece of advice for launching a book, like what was the number one thing you would suggest doing? If um, we can only choose one. I think the best thing that you can do is build a review crew that will leave reviews for you. I know that sounds like it's not really part of launch, but again, I'm constantly trying to bring new readers in. I talked about the five touches. So maybe I'll, my Facebook ad, somebody will see it and they've never heard of Liz or Elena and they go check it out. And they'll be like, oh, she's got 30 reviews. I'll read those. It's just really good social proof. 
And people can look at it and go, yeah, I want this, or no, I, this isn't the kind of book I want. I don't think Amazon really pays that much attention to reviews. I've heard people say they help with rank and blah, 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 but I don't know if I really believe that. But I do believe that reviews can really help if you're looking to get a new to you reader. And I'm constantly looking for new to me readers. I have readers that will buy already. I want more readers that will buy. So my review crew is one of the most valuable parts of my launch. I give them my books two to four weeks in advance. I collect their reviews in a Google form and I email them back on release day and I post in my group on release day. And I mean, just even having 10 up front really, I think really helps a lot. So I think that's a really valuable part of me launching. Um, Plus, it can help you secure advertising and stuff if you need it. You've got a few reviews, those kinds of things. Um, and another, uh, one more tip, I know we're almost out of time, is consistency. Be consistent about whatever it is that you're doing. So I send a newsletter every week, even if I have nothing going on. I post on, I post on my Facebook page every day, Monday through Friday, even if I don't have a whole lot going on. Um, I cultivate my review crew and my KU audience. I interact with my newsletter readers, my people on Facebook. I release consistently, and I never go outside my brand. So I, I just, those kinds of consistent things, it might take time, but you'll start to see the benefit from them when you do them. So I think that's another good tip is to be consistent in what you're doing. Awesome tip. Um, so that's all of the questions that I had for you. Do you, any of you ladies have any, or were there any more on, um, on the I live feed? I know there feed? are a few online. I have one before Michelle talks, and that is, um, do you normally do a countdown deal at some point during your launch to get that 99 cent boost, or is that just sometimes that you do that? So I just experimented with that this summer, the first time I did it. So I had the six books in the rapid release and I thought it's going to be hard to get people buying six books, you know, one right after the other. So I decided to do the countdown deal within a week of release. So book came out. I did actually, I lied. I said I did Thursdays, but I did three Tuesdays in June and three Thursdays in July. So book came out on Tuesday and I did a countdown deal the next Monday for book two that came out Tuesday. And so that book one that was on 99 cent countdown deal did really well for, I just did three days. You can do up to seven, but I just did three and it went over the launch of book two. And then um, I skipped book two because I didn't want people to think, oh, she'll put this at 99 cents on Monday. So I just tried to be really unpredictable. I didn't do a countdown deal on book two until the third week of July. But then the third book I put on countdown deal when the fourth book came out. Fourth book I didn't put on countdown deal because I gave it to my newsletter subscribers for free. So I sent it to news my newsletter subscribers in a book funnel link and said, get it. So I didn't put that one on countdown deal at all. And then the sixth one hasn't been on countdown deal yet and neither has the fifth. So I just tried it with a couple um, to see how it would go and if I liked it and if I made more money and and if it brought more people into the series. So, cause that's typically what I'm looking for is to bring more people in and make more money. So it worked do you, okay. Do you feel it was successful? Yeah, I feel like it was successful and I feel like I would try it again for sure. Um, maybe not super close to release. If you're releasing once a month, you, you would release at full price and then wait till that second book came out and do a countdown deal on it, 99 cents and release book two at full price. So, but if you're releasing at 99 cents and keeping it there for a while, it's really hard to encourage people to, to you know, I mean, you can put it on a countdown deal, but it's not a deal. So. Yeah. yeah. And you can raise the price and then lower it with a countdown deal or whatever. But um, yeah, I mean, you can just try it and see. It worked really well on the first one and really well on the second one. So I was happy with it. I was happy Good. with it. So with your countdown deals, do you like tell your newsletter about that? Do you advertise them at all? Okay. You have to be really careful that you tell them it's US and UK only because you can only do a countdown deal in the US and UK. You can do them simultaneously, but if you have readers in other countries than that, then they email you nasty grams back. This is not 99 cents. But if you put it in your newsletter that it's those, I don't ever have any problems with that. So okay. just make sure you're disclosing. Yeah, good to know. I've never done one of those. So I 
I still don't know like how it works. Like, <laughs> like I'm nervous to try because I'm like, I don't know when it, do, do they like go up? You schedule them, you schedule them and then they just go. So when it's countdown, like does it um, like start? So you, like, you can schedule it for different price points at different days if you want to. Oh, you, you can? can? Start at 99 or start at 299, whatever you want to do. You can set the price okay. you want it to be on the different days of the countdown. Okay, so you could do like ninety nine cents for each of every day of it. Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah, I didn't know if it just because I've se I'd seen someone that was like ninety nine cents one day and that was one forty nine the other day. I'm like, oh, how does that work? <laughs> so I never dare try. Yeah, you set and schedule all that yourself. I just set mine at ninety nine cents and then they go back to full price when I tell them to. So, okay, when that's I good to know. Yeah. So we did have a question about the Facebook Pixel because you mentioned that, Elena. And we have had, uh, we talked about it last weekend. Was it last week or the week before? My <laughs> Whenever we did our AMS ad podcast, okay. we talked about it a little bit. So can you tell us a little bit more about what it is? So the Facebook Pixel is just something that's in your ads manager. Super easy to find. You just click over on the left side and you'll see a little button that says Pixels. And you go there and Facebook has assigned you a number. And if you you can put that pixel on your website, you can put it in your book funnel stuff. You can, uh, those are the only two places I use it. I'm sure you could put it on a blog or something like that. And what it does is it captures the data of people who go to those pages. And you can tell it when you want it to capture. So on book funnel, it's got several options. I always choose page view. Like you don't have to, if you view that page, I collect your data. You just have to make sure that it's in your privacy policy that when they come to your website, that their data, you know, you're collecting their data. And if they want to be taken off, you have to, you have to somehow figure out how to get them out of that audience. So that's the GDPR thing that you have to deal with. But then, so what Facebook does with that data is it creates custom audiences for you based on so say Victorine comes to my website and I gather her data, it will find people on Facebook that like the same things she likes. It will target her and it, it knows what she likes. Like she, it knows what pages she's liked. It, know, it knows what ads she's clicked on. It, it's, Scary, smart. Huh? <laughs> it's, a little, it's a smart site. So anyway, and it will build an audience of people that are like Victorine to show my book to, which, and so I usually typically do, I call it a lookalike audience with my Facebook pixel and I do a 3% expansion. So it will go to people that are not just 1% like Victorine, but 3% and that's the wide, I think that's the widest you can do. I did see two to five the other day. Do you remember, it might be a two I to four. I remember. I find the best, the best success, the best relevancy on my Facebook ads with a 3% deviation from the audience. More than that, and I find my relevancy score goes down. So once you know that Pixel, I just use, I have a WordPress site. I use an app called Pixel Cat. It's super easy. You install it to your WordPress thing, you put your number in, and then you can tell it which pages you want it to collect data on. So I have it collected on all my um, book pages, my newsletter sign up page, my home page. But if I've got a really buried deep page, I don't have my Pixel on that. Um, and then for book funnel, since I send a lot of people to book funnel and I want to create an audience of people like that, um, it's just down in the advanced options and you just put your number in. It's, it's super easy once you know your number. So the pixel sounds daunting, but it's not too daunting and you can Google how to do anything and it's pretty straightforward. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, that was great. Good. And I also want to know about smart URLs, which we've talked about before too, which if you have good experience with that, go for it. <laughs> I, love I love the smart URL. You guys don't like them? I've never oh, used them. I love them. I, oh, use them. I love them. So I just use smarturl.it, I think is the website, smarturl.it. And you could, so what I do is I have an Amazon affiliates account. So I get my link, my Amazon affiliate link, and I put that in my smart URL, and that's what goes in the back of all my books and on my website. So when you click that smart URL, it takes you to the book and I earn a little bit of money if you buy something on Amazon from that click. The reason they're great 
is because, especially if you're not doing pre-orders, you can create a smart URL and call it, you know, book one. I mean, you would call it something that you know. I name mine what my books are. And, but for you, Michelle, you could do mermaid book one and put it in the back of another book or whatever, get all your marketing all set up. And as soon as the link is live, you change it in smart URL and all those links are now live and active. So you don't have to go through and change back matter anymore. You don't have to change. If your newsletter is set and scheduled, you don't have to go change the link or add the link. It's already there. So they're evergreen links. And so then if I decide, oh, man, I wish I had a smart URL or, or you know, I wish I didn't have to go change all those links. I don't do that anymore. It saves me tons of time. So I will say just for people's information. Um, I live in Arkansas, and so I can't use Amazon. Doesn't use the Amazon affiliates for people in Arkansas because they have a beef with the state of Arkansas, and they also don't have the program for people in Colorado, Rhode Island, Vermont, Maine, and Missouri. Awesome! So you're all in the same stinky boat that I am. <laughs> but there are still some great uses for smart URLs. Yes. Even if you can't take advantage of the associates program. So. Yeah. Very true. Yes. They're awesome. I like them. I wish I could use them. So um, the other thing, I think the only other question we've already talked about was with our, our launch strategy. And then there was another one about pricing, which we've talked pretty extensively about on this podcast. Wouldn't you say, Victory? Yeah. I, I, I think we have. So I think we're good with the questions there. Um, so Judy, we'll just turn it back over to you to say our good night. Oh, one more thing. Um, Amy? messaged me and said um tell everybody sorry she had to leave but her baby started freaking out mm -hmm. and she said to say goodbye to elena and thank you for coming on the show awesome <laughs> oh yeah. can i can i preview our episode for next week oh yeah, yeah. so next week we're going to be talking about audiobooks and we are excited to have um nancy peterson come on who is a voice talent who does audiobooks and she recently won an Audi. She um, is currently um, doing my audiobooks through Tantor, and um, she's also worked with um, Jen Johnson, Jennifer Peel, several other people. She's got a long list of people she's worked with, traditional publishers, indie authors through ACX. She's got a pretty broad understanding of the market, and it'll be fun to see things from her point of view and what it takes to get an audiobook out. And um, so we're looking forward to that. That's so, awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I'm excited to hear more about that because I don't have any audio book, audiobooks yet, so it'd be good to learn. Um, but yeah, I want to thank Elena for coming and teaching us all these amazing things, and I will definitely be looking at that document and probably rewatching this again because there's so much to learn. Um, but yeah, we are the Writing Gold Girl. Seriously, I can't talk tonight. <laughs> we are the writing gals. Thank you for staying up late with us, and we will see you next week. Bye.